Hey guys, today we're going to do a video. I know I've been doing a lot of just the standing here talking videos lately, and we're going to get probably a lot of those in the coming future. Um, but we today we're going to talk about a little something that is very, very, very important to everyone. So when you have reptiles, doesn't matter if you keep iguanas, crested geckos, Burmese pythons, ball pythons, corn snakes. If you have more than one, there's something that everybody should be doing, and that is quarantining. Quarantining, I think that it gets overlooked a lot, especially like for beginning people and people just coming to the hobby or just getting things every now and again. But it's something that needs to be done to ensure, you know, healthy collections and healthy and you know in the, in people's houses. And we're gonna show you how how we have our setup, which is always constantly changing, evolving, trying to do things next next level but you know quarantining procedures are more important now than really ever you know there's been a lot more research and things put out there about diseases and and viruses and illnesses that are becoming more and more apparent and honestly it seems like more common these days and so proper quarantine procedures are the best thing to do to help curb those things so like I said I'm going to talk a little bit now and then we're going to go show you kind of how we do things so the number one, the very first thing, it doesn't matter if this is your second snake or your 2000 snake or, or leopard gecko or whatever else it is, is you should always quarantine whatever animal that you're bringing into your house, whether you picked it up from your friend, from Craigslist, from a reptile show, or from an online thing. So here are some kind of like step-by-step -step ways that, and, and, and things you can do to kind of help maintain quarantine procedures. So the number one very first thing is maintain physical boundaries. And so what I mean with that is, you know, so for instance, what we have, most of our snakes are kept downstairs. That's where the majority of our collection is. That's where all the breeding animals are. They're downstairs. We have a separate room on a different floor behind a closed door. That's where all new snakes come in. That room is a little bit more temperature controlled. It's a little bit cooler, but still in the 70s. The humidity is really high. That's where we keep our uh, tropical geckos. So like a lot of our new Caledonia stuff and our amphibians. We are only breeding snakes, really. Everything else, they're just lizards and frogs in there. And so when we bring in new snakes, we're not bringing in new reptiles. We're not bringing in new geckos and stuff. If we were to bring in new geckos, they would go to a different room. Um, Eventually moving forward, I would very much like to have an entirely separate room in general where only new reptiles period go, but we're kind of limited on space because we also have all the furry critters and stuff running around and they need plenty of room too. But so whenever we bring in this new animal, this new snake, it goes into this room. There are no other snakes in that room. It's behind a shut door. So it's on a different floor. It's somewhere else. There are physical boundaries and distance between them and the rest of the snakes in the house. The next thing is, is sanitize and wash your hands. That's the biggest thing when it comes to like uh, crossing diseases. You know, not everything we know how everything is transmitted, but we do know a lot of it is through bodily fluids. So if you're cleaning a snake or you're cleaning a gecko and you're wearing, even if you're wearing gloves or, or a towel or whatever else, you know, you wipe up poop or you wipe up urates or pee or whatever else, and then you go and move to another one, if there was bodily fluids on your glove, on your hand, whatever it was, and you move to the next one, then you're technically transmitting something over to there. And while, yes, I understand just spot cleaning through things, like, so we have, um, it's it just through, like, expediency, that's just something that kind of happens, and so that's the point of the quarantine. So when I do all of our ball pythons, I will go through one full rack, and I will have one pair of gloves, or if it gets torn, or if it gets really dirty, I'll change out the gloves. But I'll do one full rack, change my gloves, sanitize my hands, put on a new pair of gloves, do the next ball python rack. Change my gloves, sanitize my hands, wash my hands, and then I move on to the boas. And that's something that is really good because, you know, a lot of diseases and a lot of vi and illnesses and viruses, the big issue why they're so horrible now in our hobby is that, you know, a lot of these things maintain their lifespan in a certain population. And then once they're brought into, you know, the boxes that we keep all of our snakes in here in here in the in the hobby and in the community and in in domestication then they start crossing and so a virus or something that lives in their natural behavior in a carpet python suddenly is interacting with a ball python that ball python doesn't have those immunities and things that are built up to withstand this virus and then you have 
something that will kill or get your ball python sick. And that's kind of what is happening is where, you know, a lot of these diseases and illnesses like nidovirus and IBD and things like that are things that existed in, you know, living populations out in the wild with native populations. And then when they're brought in captivity, they're crossing in with, you know, a snake that lives all of its time in Ecuador is now suddenly living in a box next to an animal that lives in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Those things they don't have the same, you know, biological defenses as each other. And so that's when issues happen. And so that's why you want to do your best to quarantine and make sure you have healthy animals before you bring them down. So when I talked about, you know, crossing bodily fluids and washing your hands and things like that, um, you know, you're, you still have to check on them daily, you, just like the rest of your collection. So my suggestion would be, you know, do all of your other animals in your collection first. And then the very last thing you do is you check on the quarantine animals. So in the morning, you know, whatever else, go to bed. And doing that can, you know, kind of help stop. So if they have mites, you're not taking them back to anything else. If that's the last thing you do, you're not bringing it back, you're not going into a room where there are mites. If they have a virus, if they have, you know, parasites or anything like that, doing them separately on either a different day or the very last thing, then you're not gonna bring it back to another, to the rest of the population. The next part about that is, during quarantine is you should probably, and when I say probably, I mean, let's be honest, you need to take that animal to the vet to get it seen. So if it's a wild caught or an import or anything like that, it needs to be seen both for a health check by, you know, a very trusted exotic animal vet, which not all exotic vets have training or experience with reptiles. You know, maybe they're used to seeing rabbits or horses or livestock or something like that. So, you know, you kind of need to do your research, ask in your local community online where a good reptile vet is, and you take them to a trusted reptile vet, you have them screened for health, and then you have them treated for parasite loads, both external and internal. You know, external parasites, you know, ticks, mites, and things like that. And then internal, there's worms and little things like that that can be treated both at home, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend in general, but taking to the, to the vet and then having them start to treat them. And so that is done during your quarantine period. I would recommend for the quarantine period, a minimum of 30 days. I like to do 60 days. And then for all boas, I do 90 days. Um, and the thing about proper quarantine procedures, so any animal that goes into that room, that's when that quarantine period starts. And so if you pick up a snake at the NARBC show in February, that starts in February, but then you go to your local Repticon in, in the end of April, that whole period starts back up again at April. So it, at least in my opinion, I think that's what's really good because then you introduce a new snake into that quarantine area before that happens again. And so when you when you bring in the new snake and that will start that over again. So you have the snake that you picked up at the Tinley show in February and you get it tested or you wait because you know you're planning on going to your local Repticon or something like that. You wait and then you'll take all of the snakes to the vet at the same time, but your quarantine period should restart and reset to the date to where you got that last snake. So we picked up some in Dallas in February and then we picked up snakes again at the end of March. Any snake that we got in February, they're going to be there for whatever, how long it was until we're into that. And, you know, when it comes time to, to uh, testing or bringing your animals to the vet, that's what we did. So we brought in, we, you know, we, we, we checked all of the animals for parasites. We checked them for mites. We treated them for mites, whether they had them or not. Um, we keep them on paper towels. So that way we can better monitor them while they're in quarantine. So if they have mites, we can see them crawling around. If they have parasites, we can see it in their fecal matter. And things like that and then when it came time to testing we test every single boa that comes in for ibd ibd is a scary little disease where that would which sorry ibd stands for inclusion body disease it's this really scary paris uh virus that um it's a type of arena virus and there are a lot of arena viruses out there um and it's a really complicated uh thing that i don't really want to get too too in depth but um, long story short, it's this thing that essentially kind of started with boas in captivity. They think that may have, it may have originally come from rats or, or something like that. Um, but it only affects boa-type snakes, they think so far. So that's boas and pythons. Um, 
And the scary thing about IBD is that boas are kind of this almost natural carrier. They're not a passive carrier because eventually it, it will kill the animal, but it's this disease that starts in boas and they can carry it with no symptoms whatsoever for years. They can be born with it and have it for years. But if a python contracts it, it is 100% fatal. And as far as I'm aware, there's never been an animal that has contracted it. That's a python that's lived longer than three months. And that's something that if you keep any sort of python, you know, green tree, carpet, ball python, whatever, and if you bring in a boa, that can wipe out an entire collection. And that's a really, really scary thing. And, um, and so if you're doing boas, that's something that you need to do is you need to have them checked for IBD because they can carry it for a very long time. We had, um, and this is the first time that I've really brought this up, we originally wanted to be boa breeders. And so we spent a lot of money, a lot of time investing in specific morphs and specific lines from people very specifically, then we brought these animals in. We quarantined them all for you know months and months and months, but we didn't test for IBD. We just quarantined them for three to six months total. Everything was, we did everything, you know, we made sure they didn't have mites. We quarantined for this period. We didn't have interact with our pythons. Eventually they cleared the quarantine period. We moved them downstairs and then we had a snake up and die in a very kind of violent way. And that's an indicator that it was IBD. We had a necropsy done, which is essentially the same as like an autopsy for an animal. We took it to a vet. They tested some of the tissue. He had it, which means we had to test every single boa and every single animal that ever came in contact with. Like we had a couple ball pythons tested because they were in the same rack as a boa three times. And that's just something that needs to happen. And I'm not going to go into detail about all of that, but that's something that just needs to happen. And then now there's this thing, nidovirus, which in all honesty is probably scarier than IBD because essentially there's some sort of nidovirus that exists on, in probably every reptile species, at least that we keep here. And they found it out in the wild in Australia in shingleback skinks. And it's been found in, in, uh, and geckos here in captivity and carpets and green trees and a boa and a king snake um, and nidovirus can wipe out entire collections too and so testing for nidovirus is also something that I think needs to happen um, there's cryptovirus which we don't know a whole whole lot about um, you can test for that as well although usually with crypto um, within that you know three month testing period if an animal does have it usually will end up expiring unfortunately but that's, you know, this is kind of the dark side of keeping animals and reptiles, especially if you're keeping large amounts, if you're trying to be a breeder. This is something that we need to do to put in place to make sure that not only are our populations healthy, we're selling healthy animals to everyone else. So, you know, it's everyone gets mites. It's something that happens. I mean, if you go to a reptile show and you don't even buy an animal, you can bring mites home. But selling an animal with mites is not okay and no one should be doing that. And you would never intentionally sell an animal with mites. And so you want to take every step that you can to prevent that. Just like I think everyone should take steps to prevent having a potentially sick animal. Stuff happens. I'm not saying that anyone is a bad breeder for selling an animal with that. But that's just something that everyone should, you know, moving forward to take our reptile or to make to take the reptile hobby to the next level is we need to take these steps. We need to make sure that we're testing, we're quarantining our animals. And we're moving forward with that. So now we're going to go over to our quarantine or tropical room and show you kind of how we do things. So this is our little quarantine rack in our area. So, you know, you can see, like I, like I mentioned earlier, we have, you know, the crested geckos and things like that in this room. That's where we have all the lizards, but we're not breeding lizards and other things like that. This is only for the snake quarantine. So that way, anything like that, like the rest of our animals are healthy and there aren't really a whole lot of transferable diseases like IBD and stuff. It's mostly just mites. And even then, those are snake mites. They can, li they can transport over and carry on on, the, on, the lizard, on lizards and things like that, but they don't suck the blood of those. They're only just for snake mites. So here's our little quarantine setup. We don't have a whole lot of animals in quarantine right now. We have a boa, a ball python, a gopher snake and right here is the mix is the gray banded king snake um, i have this big lid on here because any tiny little colubrid wants to get away obviously and he's in here so as we talked about before these are kind of smaller containers they're kept on paper towels 
You know, here's the little, just the water bowl, just clean paper towel and things like that. <clears throat> so here we have our little, come here, our little male Alterna who pooped in between this. And so we're going to clean this today. Like I said, we're still checking on them every single day. This is going to be the last thing we do. So here's just our little gray banded king snake. So when we talked about, you know, everything in here being the last thing we do, everything lives in here. So we're going to take this. I'm going to put it over here in the trash. And then here is our little setup over here for all the tools that specifically live in here. These don't leave. This is the roll of paper towels for the room. This is the hand sanitizer for the room, the tongs, the tweezers, the chemicals. This is all only for this room. They don't leave here. So that way there's no cross contamination between those two. And so, you know, we dump that out. We're going to go back over there. Just a little cleaning spray. And we're gonna wipe this out. And then back we go. And these are just, you know, it's a paper towel, so they always have to get replaced, but that's what's good thing about paper towels when it comes to quarantining animals, thank you, is this way we can better monitor their health. You know, it's a, if, you know, if there are, if there are snake mites on this animal that were on its gray and black parts, they're really hard to see visibly, but if they'll pop up in the water or on this paper towel, they're easier to monitor. That's why we use paper towels for quarantine. Um, and as far as like things in this room go at, you know, it's, things just always need to be checked. So, you know, over here we have our little pastel gravel who's quite cranky almost all of the time. You can see him getting kind of huffy and puffy. Um, just things like, uh, and even like, yes, he's a little grumpy, but monitoring his behavior and keeping it on things like that, we can see if there's any detriment. We can look at his face and things like that a little bit easier. But everything in this room is hopefully makes it better for them to, you know, be healthy and make sure that they're being done with very well. The humidity in this room is just the ambient humidity in this room is always over 60% because it's great for the geckos and things. And so it's a little bit cooler than what they need, but that's why we run the back belly heat for them, um, running a little hot spots so that way the humidity is good, the heat's good, so that way that is really dialed in just for this room. So that way we don't have to worry too, too much about shedding and things like that, which will allow us to better maintain the health of the animals. So. You know, mites, that's the most common thing when it comes to dealing with animals bring, coming in from regardless of where you go. So, you know, good mite treatments. I'm not going to do a mite, treat, uh, mite treating video. You know, everyone puts them out there. They're all really good. You know, just don't use a whole lot of harsh chemicals directly on the animal. That's never good. But when it comes to just like when I talked before about maintaining physical barriers, you know, we have this, this diatinaceous earth. It's, you know, this is a food grade quality thing where the point of this stuff is it dehydrates the animals. And so you put, you sprinkle this on the floor or wherever else, the insects or the mites or whatever will run through that and it will literally dehydrate them and kill them like that. And so whenever we bring in a new animal, we'll sprinkle stuff around the floor of this in between the tubs across the seam of the bore of the floor. And during the mite treatment, when we first get them in, and after a couple of weeks of them being mite treated and we're not seeing any mites that we've broken that cycle, we're not seeing any more, then we'll sweep it up and clean it up and we'll continue on. But that's why we have this in this room. So like I said before, everything is meant to be the last thing. It's all meant to be self-contained. I have a bucket of water here that is only for this room to refill this. I have a trash bucket, a dump bucket of water for to dumping that which can be taken directly to the bathroom. We use an entirely separate sink. We use our bathroom sink. Everything else is used either for the kitchen, for the rest of the house, reptiles upstairs, or downstairs we have their own separate thing. Hand sanitizers doesn't leave here. All of these tools are left here and sanitized in this room. These are spray bottles that are made up with different cleaning solutions. One of these is, uh, is a mite treatment solution. And everything lives in this room just to maintain the quarantine procedures. And once again, I would recommend a minimum of three months, 30, 60 days. I would say do 90 days for really everything just to make sure you clear them. And then please, 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 please make sure that you do a health check that you do test your animals for 
whatever may have you. Hey guys, I hope that you found this, you know, at least informational. I know, and it's, you know, it, it's, I just, I'm just going to keep stuttering. It's really important that we do these steps, you know. Mites happen, there's, it literally can, it literally happens to anyone. And anyone says they have never had a mite outbreak, they're either only ever had one snake or they're lying. You know, it's impossible not to get them at some point. You can pick them up at a reptile show, coming and going in and out of, you know, your local reptile shop or whatever else. People come in, they have it, people are selling them, it happens. Mites are sometimes really hard to miss, you know, animals that kind of go and then, you know, animals with NIDO or IBD or something like that, a lot, they, they get kind of expensive. The testing can be expensive, not everyone can do that, but, and, and I'm not saying that if you pick that up at a store or from a breeder that they're awful, these horrible people, but moving forward, this is something that needs to happen. And so if we take the steps now and we make it so everyone is doing this, then everyone else will start doing that as well, moving the entire industry forward. So I'm not saying that we need to start a witch hunt for people who are not doing this, but if we start doing that and moving forward, people will stop going to those breeders or stores who say, or not, not necessarily like that, but people will, will be better and, and be more cognizant of the health of animals. Like I said, mites happen, things get overlooked, some things, you know, you get a, pos, a, a false positive or a false negative or something like that. But, you know, we just need to be more cognizant and, and you know, some stuff is entirely out of our, out of our, out of our hands to do, but taking these steps of proper quarantine, watching animals, monitoring their health, watching their behavior, that's the first step that we need to do to move forward with this. Sorry, this has been a very ranty one. Hopefully you got at least an interesting little breakaway. Um, you got to see at least an animal for the first time in a while. Um, uh, if you did, you know, come away with something with this video, that's awesome. Please let me know down in the comments if you had any ideas, if I missed anything, I touched on anything, if you have any questions, um, let me know down, uh, you know, on, on Instagram, Jay-Z's Reptiles, on our Facebook page, we update there pretty frequently. Um, if you have any uh, questions about things like that, hopefully we're going to have some uh, ball pythons being legs, ball python legs, ball python eggs being laid soon. Um, maybe we'll keep you updates on that about pairings, hopefully possible offspring. We'll see how that goes. Um, sh please share with your family. Uh, please share with, you know, please share this video, like, subscribe, hit that bell notification. Um, you know, talk to your, to your family, other people in the community about, you know, quarantining or really anything to do with the hobby about moving things forward and making things better for everybody. Um, once again, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate all the, all the viewers, all the video watchers. Thanks again, and I'll catch you next time.